So um, just to set the stage for everything, I've got four general opening comments I want to make. Um, just a reminder to everybody that this is a critical week, critical week to get things started. And if you haven't planted so far, uh, this is the time, but don't worry um, if you're growing transplants or very short season crops like radishes, turnips, lettuce, various greens, you've still got time, but uh, summer does come quickly and it comes by, it ends quickly just as well. And fortunately, we've got those long days to, of sunshine to make up for it. Um, I also want to add, uh, mention to people that in addition to what you normally grow, uh, always, always experiment a little and consider some of the perennial crops uh, with examples being the, the spring onions I was talking about earlier. Uh, everyone knows about rhubarb. You plant in the corner of your yard, you've got it every year, whether you use it or not. And there's also a lot of perennial um, herbs and greens such as lovage, sorrel, tarragon that come back year after year. So even though uh, I was over at the community garden this week, planting uh, my garden beds there this week, uh, my onions are already probably 10 to 16 inches tall. And uh, the lovage is about a foot tall and the sorrel is about four inches tall. And I haven't done anything to those at all this year. So that's the advantage of perennials. Also, I wanna to mention to people that uh, this time of year, you're also amending your soil or in the fall. Uh, if you're adding compost or manure, just a reminder to everybody, find out where it comes from. And even though you have manure from someone who has horses or cattle, where did their hay come from? We've had some ongoing issues up here with uh, residual herbicides coming through. And there's a couple classes of herbicides being used down in Alberta, among other places, Saskatchewan, that uh, will... It's great for growing a hay crop, it suppresses the weeds. However, when livestock eat it, it will pass through the stomach of a cow unaltered and it comes out of the manure. And if you get that manure or you make compost from the manure, the residual herbicide will stay active for up to five years. And you put it on your tomato plants and all of a sudden the growth tips start looking like um, little little green claws like unfurling fiddleheads and they're obviously uh, deformed because of the growth hormones in there um, so keep an eye on it we've had some come from private suppliers we've had some pop up from commercial suppliers it's kind of sneaky if you suspect you have any herbicide uh, residues in your soil or compost let us know we can give you information on how to determine if it is indeed and uh, they say it does not affect mammals, but still, if your vegetables are deformed, uh, you should be concerned and learn out what's going on. Uh, so those are my general opening comments. And I have four advanced questions I will get onto here, and then we'll start going into the chat to see what else we have with uh, this afternoon's questions. So uh, my first question is, uh, what? What would I like to say about potential errors gardeners make up north or common mistakes? Uh, I, I've got three definite ones. Uh, one is uh, planting too early. You know, planting too late is an obvious one, but planting too early. I know when the sun comes out in February and March, it's just, it's hard not to plant things, to to put in some zucchini, to put in some sunflowers. And usually what happens is you're gonna get plants that are very weak, uh, straggly, spindly, and they're not gonna do that well. Um, generally, if you check your seed packets, there's gonna be information about uh, plant X number of weeks before your last frost date. And just assume June 1st for the White Horse area for an average frost free date. Uh, and count backwards. And, and actually we've put together an information sheet I hand out of the Master Gardener course that we've gone through all the seed packets for common flowers, herbs, and vegetables and have like a countdown calendar, which is a good reference tool. So yeah, planting too early is definitely one of the, the top three big mistakes. Too much love. Um, that is also sometimes you can uh, there's all sorts of products out there um, if you're using any any sort of a synthetic fertilizer like a miracle grow type thing makes blue water red water um, twice as much 
twice as much is not twice as good. You can develop salt issues, salinity issues in your soil, and they'll work great to a point, and, but too much fertilizer will potentially burn or stunt your plants. Uh, the nutrients and fertilizers, if you uh, have a bit of background chemistry, um, they are ionized uh, elements that have to go across a osmotic barrier to get into cells. And if the salt levels are too high, it, it cannot work. Uh, the plants cannot take up the nutrients and uh, it'll become toxic eventually. So there are, I have seen some cases of too much love and that would be uh, excessive commercial compost, excessive amounts of synthetic fertilizer on top of that excessive amounts of fresh manure and it all adds up and uh, follow instructions if you're using anything like that and use in moderation. Uh, the other third one here for common mistakes is that if you have your own backyard compost, use as much as you want. You could even grow in it. I'm sure we've all seen potatoes and squash popping up in your compost pile. Let those grow. But if you're using commercial compost, usually the systems are closed, which means that the rainwater isn't washing the salts out and the salts will build up. Salts are also uh, nutrients in the soil. So... Uh, commercial compost, whether from down south or locally produced. Uh, if you're putting them on virgin soil, I would recommend about not putting on 10 inches of compost and mixing it in because there'll be too much salinity the first year. And if you use large amounts of compost, I would say water the heck out of it. There's so many nutrients and salts, you want to rinse out the salts. So if you, if you put, say, four inches of commercial compost on your greenhouse beds and your beds do not have any drainage for the salt to leach out, those salts will start to communicate and build up. And they'll, they'll, things will grow rampantly to start with, and then they'll slow down. And uh, it's a very recognizable soil profile when we get the soil tested and uh, to see what people have been doing there. So that's three of the common mistakes I have. And uh, the second of the four early questions I have is, what is the best soil for starting seedlings in? <clears throat> and ironically, the name of the best soil is soil-less potting mix. Several brand names out there, and they're soilless. It, it still looks like dirt, but soilless means that it's not made from mineral soil. It's made from peat moss. And the idea is that what you want to use for your starting your seedlings is something that is loose light uh, has good air uh, permeation and good water retention so that's really important soilless mixes are generally based on peat and they don't have the minerals in there the heavy sands silts and clays um, they also don't have much nutrition so some of these mixes will say oh contains trace amounts of fertilizer that's good uh, they will hold water they'll hold air and um which is all good, and uh, but you have to keep an eye on your seedlings. They'll grow great, and then they'll start to slow down. So you may need to use uh, a little bit of water-soluble fertilizer at a diluted rate to top them up after a few weeks. And uh, my best example there is if you grow tomatoes yourself and you use a soilless mix, you'll notice that the leaves start turning darker green, which is good, <clears throat> and then they'll get kind of a reddish hue to them. So that is a mineral deficiency. Uh, once they're in outside soil, uh, they'll pick up the, the native minerals. But in the meantime, you might need to put a little bit of dilute uh, water-soluble fertilizer. And, and you can get away with using outside soil to start your seeds. However, with the outside soil comes a number of different uh, microflora and fauna and pathogens and potentially fungi and these can attack your plants because the the populations of these organisms will um, exponentially take off in a warm hot humid humid climate in your your growing conditions indoors so if you use outdoor soil uh, use it cautiously uh, soilless mix gives you a bit of an advantage there and i'll avoid the brand names but there's a lot of different uh, varieties out there uh, let's see. Okay. Two more questions on the advanced questions here. Um, I didn't have much luck planting seeds in a seed starting tray using potting soil. 
growing on a north facing window, natural light, half the seeds sprouted, others were extremely leggy, many shriveled up and died. Uh, what should I do next year? So a few things, um, use a sterile soil, like uh, these um, things you describe uh, could be from many things. So make sure you start with a sterile uh, soil mix, like a soilless mix. Uh, with good good looseness, light water holding capacity, uh, use fresh seed. Quite often there are certain types of seeds that the germination rate will degenerate year after year. Uh, home collected seed often has a lower germination rate um, and certainly five-year-old seed, but I sometimes you can get lucky. I have grown 10-year-old seed with some luck, but uh, some things like parsnips, uh, germination drops off dramatically after the first year. Uh, as I mentioned previously, if you use soilless mix, you may need to feed the plants after a few weeks. Uh, growing by a window, uh, you have to think about growing temperature. Are there drafts off a window? Is uh, the room cold at night? So trying to maintain an even temperature is good. You want to make sure you have good airflow when you're doing seedlings indoors, because if you have poor airflow, you could get some fungi uh, related issues like damping off where all of a sudden your seedlings will start to fall over like little uh, woodcutters went through. They'll get soft in the stem and then collapse and it'll be like a slow avalanche over four or five days on your seed flat. They'll uh, go down one by one. Uh, let's see, also, oh yes, north window. So light intensity and duration, uh, you wanna get at least 10 to 12 hours of direct light, which is hard in a window, especially in the winter time, and your light intensity is very low. So your plants will become leggy and spindly. And if you can, uh, if you have a great uh, southern window or trying to get as many hours as possible per day or even artificial lighting with uh, for seedlings, you can get away with uh, like the, the long three foot long uh, fluorescent tubes cool white and warm white. Uh, you can control things a lot better. You should use those for a few weeks in the spring. So all sorts of ideas there on how to get better seedlings to grow each year. Uh, and then my final advanced question. It's great. It's from someone else who loves their insects, just like I do. Uh, huge numbers of garden calembolas in my raised beds. They're eating the leaves off my seedlings. What options for controlling them? And uh, which is really great. I, I, I'm a bit of an insect nerd as well. And um, so uh, Calembola and springtails in general are very, very tiny insects, generally known as detritivores. You'll see them in your compost pile or in the spring when there's pools of snow melt, you'll see them on the surface and we call those uh, snow fleas. So they're normally present all the time, but when they're on the water, these are tiny, tiny insects. They're, they're uh, one to one and a half millimeters in length. If you need reading glasses, you probably won't see these in your soil, but if you get a hand lens or a microscope, you'll see them, they're out there. And technically um, they're actually, I, I just read today that they're no longer considered insects. They're hexapods, but they're in a, a different uh, grouping now, a very ancient family, but for intensive purposes, they are. so. Um, I also thought that there's straight detritivores breaking down soil components, detritus, but apparently they're omnivorous. So they can get into your plants when the numbers get as high. And uh, you had mentioned that the um, uh, flea beetles popped up. So first I thought, oh, if they're chewing on the leaves, they're probably flea beetles. But since this person did get out a microscope and look at them and, and confirm that they were uh, calembla or springtails, um, yeah, anyways, the this way to deal with them is is suitable for both. Um, probably the safest thing to use for any of those tiny insects would be a uh, diatomaceous earth. For those of you who haven't uh, seen diatomaceous earth before, you can get it uh, in all the garden centers. It's basically uh, crushed uh, calcareous remains or skeletons of diatoms from millennia ago or millions of years ago. And it's an abrasive. Uh, basically, it uh, wears down the outside skin or cuticle of insects, and then they 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 bleed or 
desiccate and that deals with them that way. It's not toxic. I wouldn't breathe in the dust. It's corrosive, but uh, you can put that out and uh, whether it's flea beetles, springtails, calembola, snow fleas, it will deal with them all. And uh, I saw another, uh, I did a quick check online. I saw another interesting uh, home-based remedy for uh, dealing with uh, calembola. Where did it go? And they're talking about using a dilute mixture of rubbing alcohol with water and a dash of liquid soap. I would test that carefully on some plants first. So this with the rubbing alcohol and dish soap, those would be um, ingredients to uh, permeate the waxy cubicle of small insects and hexapods uh, and desiccate them. And the soap, liquid soap would be a surfactant to help get through there as well. So I haven't tried the isopropyl alcohol slash rubbing alcohol water dish soap one myself, but um, I have tried diatomaceous earth and that, that works fairly well. And uh, yeah. Oh, and there's one last question that was sent in advance. And I think this is something that we all wonder about. Uh, somebody bought a uh, cubic meter compost from the city as it was being loaded. They saw the machine pulling out all the plastic bags and wrappers from the compost. And that's a great thing. But now the question that's been in the media recently is how much plastic remains in the compost? And uh, does that microplastic get into the food? Does it get into us? It's, uh, we've been hearing that basically it's everywhere. Uh, it's in uh, our lake water. I think I heard something in the paper about uh, people are finding traces in our blood. Um, but yeah, just just amazing. But uh, anyways, um, the question was in this, yeah, how much is remaining? Has it ever been studied as to how much might be in it? Um, no, I have never seen any studies on compost, local or outside, as to how much plastic remains. But certainly um, having that machine that was made locally, invented locally for removing the plastic bags um, is a great thing to help reduce that. And the less plastic we have in our diets, the better. Um, anything we can do uh, when you're doing your own compost makes you take those labels and bags and wrappers off. And certainly, uh, yeah, something to watch for in uh, news articles. But uh, I believe uh, the question will be put to the city if they ever get their compost tested to see about microplastics. <clears throat> but yes, I think that's beyond the realm of most of what we can do. And, but it is certainly a global issue and uh, we'll learn more about that as we go on. So let's switch over to, let me check the chat. Oh, there's all sorts of things in the chat here. <clears throat> yeah, let's run through some of these questions as well. We have a question about permaculture and lasagna gardening without livestock for manure. Hmm, I think you still can. For people that don't know, um, by lasagna gardening, that is the process where you're building up layers of soil and compost as you'd build a lasagna with your different components. So it's actually layered and with time, it starts to compost on its own. And permaculture is a process of having permanently planted things like my spring onions and other perennial vegetables and berries and trees. So um, I'm trying to think, uh, yeah, I would say you would need some nitrogen sources other than uh, if you don't have manure from livestock or chickens. Uh, think about uh, fish emulsion. That's a great nitrogen source. You could also factor in natural source nitrogen source such as uh, blood meal, bone meal, feather meal. There's all sorts of products you can get at the garden center that are natural and high in nitrogen to help make that process work. <clears throat> and uh, I like to address all, all camps of thought. So there's not only the natural source ones, but synthetic. But the good thing about the natural source ones say as like blood meal is that you don't have that issue of potentially over, um, over fertilizing or burning your crops. They're all slow release 
and they'll work out. If you know somebody with chickens, that's even better, but it's potent stuff. And some of these liquid uh, versions of things like fish emulsion, you could just make a more dilute version and water from above and it will percolate through. Yeah, so even though all you have on hand are leaves, uh, that's your carbon source. And uh, yeah, get that nitrogen source and away you go. Okay, uh, question here. Uh, hopefully I'm not too far behind. Could you please discuss no-till gardening in reference to raised beds amendment and which plants might work best in the junction? Okay, um, no-till gardening is basically, uh, um, I have dropped rototilling myself. I have an old rototiller, but uh, the downside of rototilling is if you end up with a, uh, say a chickweed issue or other weeds, um, you will keep bringing those to the surface and with no-till uh, gardening, things uh, that are below the surface stay below and you just keep adding things on top. Um, the other issue with rototillers is that you, when you mix up the soil strata and layers, you're also disturbing the natural regime of microflora and fauna. And if you're lucky enough to have earthworms in your garden or garden beds, that a rototiller will uh, massacre them. And even though they say, oh, if you cut a worm in half, both halves will grow a worm. I think that's more about uh, nematodes in a Petri dish. Earthworms might, but I think the casualty rate is pretty high still. So uh, no-till gardening is a way around that. Amendments, if you compost on the side, add your compost on top. Uh, what plants might work best with no-till? I would say using transplants always works. Um, if you're using no-till, I think you could still dig your garden. But one thing we do at the community garden is that we uh, generally, when we can get access to old seeds, such as legumes uh, or grains, to if you're not planting all of your garden to plant a section every year with the peas and grains and then use that as a green manure and just turn it over so you're not tilling it but you are turning it over uh, and that adds a lot of organic matter uh, for doing that sort of thing um, in a commercial scale no-till gardening uses uh, or no-till farming uses a seed drill that actually cuts the soil and then the seeds are dropped in and the soil's closed behind it. And that mimics a natural system where the top layer is most biologically active and uh, the organisms that break down uh, the organic matter into nutrients are left where they are to work uh, at what they do best. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, yeah, moving right along. Oh. Sprouting beans. I do have some advice on that. Uh, this person's had bad luck sprouting beans. Any tips for starring plus what eats the early leaves? Well, um, there are many different varieties and classes of beans, different families. Uh, say, if we focus on uh, bush beans, green beans, uh, we're doing a lot of... Uh, uh, we're actually doing a research project out on those out at the research farm for the last couple of years. And some varieties of beans, some say, oh, the white beans are this, the black beans are that, but you get everything in between. So there are certainly some varieties of bush beans that are better suited to germinating in cool soils. Most beans are more suited for germinating in warm soils. And if you have problems, I would say pre-germinate them in cups or small pots in the house and then once they're coming up transplant them you could even pre-sprout them wrapped in a paper towel in a cup and then when you see the rootlets coming out plant them outside when the soil is warm enough I wouldn't do uh, if you plant beans in mid-May probably most of them will rot and you won't see them come up um, some of the beans that are uh, I guess the industry standard for cold soil tolerant beans would be the heirloom variety provider. And they uh, are known as one of the best green bush beans for germinating in cool soils. And as you all know, Whitehorse uh, Yukon in general has, has cold soils. If uh, you're in a greenhouse, they'll do a little bit better. 
but uh, if they're already germinated, um, soak them overnight, put them in a paper towel, uh, wait for the, the root tips to come out and inoculate them. Use that black powder you get and that will uh, allow the natural nitrogen fixing bacteria to get onto the roots to help them form nodules to create their own nitrogen out of atmospheric nitrogen. And that should help you out with, uh, with beans. And then if you're growing something, say like uh, scarlet runner beans, uh, they do like their warm soil. So you'll have more luck with those um, planting them, I would say under uh, in, a, in a cup indoors or a small pot, or uh, if they are outside in a greenhouse or in a protected location with at least a row cover over top to help warm the soil and retain the warmth in the soil. You'll, uh, actually I've got some on my counter right now, just uh, beginning to germinate. So I'll be planting those tonight or tomorrow. But yes, um, provider is the standard for cold soil tolerant beans. There was another one a few years ago called Tema, T-E-M-A. And it was actually more productive than provider. And then mysteriously, the variety disappeared. Uh, who knows? But yeah, green beans can be very productive as an outdoor crop. Uh, the um, What we call it out of the research farm is we have a three-year marginal crop study being done with Agriculture Canada's research center out of Newfoundland with uh, repeat plots in Newfoundland, Labrador, and there were supposed to be some in the Northwest Territories. And we're looking at different techniques for warming soils from solar soil covers to short row covers and short tunnels and combinations of each. But if you can avoid those late or early in the season frosts uh, in August, you can get an amazing amount of crop out of those. I think at the community garden, we had a row of provider once in a 20 foot row. I think we produced 30 pounds of green beans. So they're productive and tasty and good for you. But if there's any frost, you need to protect them. But I can't go wrong with growing green beans. Okay, looks like I'm caught up. So do we have other questions? We can do a short pause for station identification. Um, the picture behind me, if you wonder, is from the Whitehorse Community Garden, and this would be a early August shot. Oops. Yeah, I can see uh, some nasturtium flowers behind me and all sorts of beans. This is the South Garden, if you don't know the Community Garden. As well, the uh, Community Garden, I was telling people earlier, every Wednesday we have a work bee, but we like to kick it off with a 30 minute mini workshop. Uh, last night's was at uh, uh, 5.30 and we had one on perennial spring onions, which is the heirloom uh, collected from the Kanchatka Peninsula over on uh, eastern Russia across the Bering Sea by University of Alaska 20 or 30 years ago. And they're a great perennial vegetable to put in your garden. Oh, there we go. More questions. Okay. <clears throat> My geranium leaves are turning red. Have I over fertilized? Well, it could be the opposite. It could be a mineral deficiency. I was saying tomatoes uh, earlier can sometimes start to turn red if there's a, I'm trying to remember if it's a magnesium, manganese. I'd have to look it up. It could even be a potassium deficiency, but um yeah, so by geraniums, I'm, I'm assuming you mean the zonal geraniums, uh, the horticultural ones. But uh, yeah, it could be a mineral deficiency as well. As well. Uh, with fertilizing, uh, sometimes less is more or use, uh, don't over fertilize for sure. Don't double the rate. Let's see, oh, lots more questions. <clears throat> Uh, if you have a small outside raised vegetable garden and deck with potted tomatoes, peppers, flowers, what is the best way to protect them from colder temperatures and hail? Yes, we've been getting hail when it comes out suddenly. I would say um, I cannot 
dress enough that uh, floating row covers are a fantastic addition to northern gardens, not only early in the season, but late in the season. Uh, one of our biggest restrictions up here is cold soil. So by doing a floating row cover, and if you're not familiar with floating row covers, it's a um, spun bond uh, synthetic fabric that's very durable, it's UV treated. It, it looks like a, a cotton cloth, but very, very lightweight. And they call it floating because you don't need to have the support arches to hold it up. The strength of the plants will support the cloth as long as you have enough slack in the cloth and you just pin down the corners with rocks or a two by four. And they will, um, the, that material will give you three or four degrees of frost protection, which is critical in the spring. It's like a mini greenhouse. It'll warm your soil, let your plants grow faster. And uh, it would provide a buffer against the hail, which seems to be more like early June, but I think any month uh, you can get that up here. Um, but yeah, whether that's a raised garden bed or potted plants, you could, if it's a tomato tower, you could always wrap it around and, and at least until mid June, that would really give your plants a boost and protect from colder temperatures. And again, as we get into uh, mid August, we can suddenly get low overnight temperatures to have uh, those row cloths handy. And if you say had a large pot of uh, green beans on your deck or tomatoes, uh, wrap them up with your row cover, put them in place with the clothes peg, get that three or four degrees of frost protection in case things drop at 2 a.m. and you're not awake. Uh, that will help you out. Okay, good companion plants for potatoes is the next question. Uh, you know, the, the neat thing about... Um, potatoes is that there's so much space that's unused when you first put them in. And one piece of advice I like to give uh, gardeners is that after you plant your potatoes, why not intercrop and put a row of uh, something really fast like spinach or radishes in between your rows of potatoes. Because when the potatoes emerge and get wide enough to come out, uh, these super early crops will be ready to harvest. And if you take the road, floating row cover I was talking about earlier and put that over top of your potatoes and your intercropped early plants, uh, you will prevent the root maggot flies from getting to your radishes or early turnips. And so not only will you get your crop of potatoes, but you'll get a perfect crop of early uh, radishes with no root maggot holes in them, which is a real nuisance. Nothing worse than going to all that trouble and having a little brown hole tunneling through your radishes. So uh, it's not more of a, it's not necessarily a companion plant, but uh, it definitely intercropping will maximize the use of that space. Uh, let's see, moving down the list. Do we have a companion planting guide for the Yukon? No, Ooh, not specifically. There's some general information out there. Uh, by companion plants, we mean plants that will benefit uh, one another by growing together. Um, I used to have a, a cheat sheet I did for the Master Gardener course. I don't have that on hand, but there's a number of uh, that type of information online and in there. And there are certain plants that you want to avoid growing together. Some plants such as uh, two that come to mind would be uh, sunflowers and Nicotiana. Both have what they call allelopathic uh, traits, which means that they exude chemicals like walnut trees that prevent the growth of other plants nearby. And if you've ever grown uh, Nicotiana, you'll see that plants nearby do not grow as well or plants you grow the following season do not grow as well. Sunflowers, I haven't seen as much, but I've heard that they uh, had those tendencies as well. So some plants are good to plant together, some are not, and there are some lists out there. Okay, let's see. Having a problem growing horseradish in an old lasagna bed. Hmm, I'm wondering with, uh, I, I've only grown horseradish off and on. I'm just wondering if the, Horseradish needs maybe if you're growing a, a lasagna 
uh, style built bed if it's too too many nutrients or too rich for the horseradish. Uh, I'd be curious to see what the problem with the horseradish is. Generally, it's uh, fairly invasive. It spreads. Um, I, as far as I know, it doesn't have huge uh, nutritional needs. It's a pretty tough plant that you can catch growing in ditches and abandoned lots and things. So usually it's pretty tough. Okay, uh, do you have a handout on which plants are heavy to light feeders? Um, not specifically. Again, this information is in a lot of books and that. Um, and by heavy and light feeders, some, some need a lot of nutrition, some need more nitrogen. Um, and this is something you want to keep in mind when you're rotating your crops from year to year. You want to go with, um, say, something like a legume to build the soil, to put nitrogen into it, follow it with something uh, such as a uh, uh, lettuce or greens crops, which like to use the nitrogen. Following that, you'd want to have something that uh, would be looking at more into using phosphorus and potassium, less nitrogen. Some crops don't do well with too much nitrogen. Um, okay, but there is uh, some detailed discussion on that and some several books in the EMR library touch on that topic as well. Makes for good reading. Uh, let's see. I have read that minerals cannot be taken up by some plants when the soil is cool. Yes. I had some tomatoes in the greenhouse with purple leaves. Ah, could be cold temperatures tied in with the mineral deficiency. I put plastic over the soil to help it warm up and the leaves turn green. Uh, yes, and um, I don't wanna flip through my uh, garden manual right now, but we, um, the EMR library has a copy of this book and, oh, I don't have it right here. I thought I had it on, oh, here it is. This is a great, hopefully I haven't been cut off the screen, but I'll just get this book out of a stack. Oops, there we go. It's disappearing on me. Anyways, the Yukon Gardener's Manual. We also sell these at the Ag Branch. Um, they're 20 or $25, but you can sign it out for free in the EMR library. And this is the manual we base the Master Gardener's course. And there's actually a table in it. I don't have this one book that tells you about all the, oh, here we go. Uh, the listed mineral deficiencies with the signs of the deficiencies. So red, purple, and very dark green foliage is a phosphorus deficiency. So also cold soils will bring about that deficiency. Your plants cannot take it up as well. And tomatoes are a classic case of that. So even if you're growing in warm conditions, you get those dark greeny purple leaves. You'll recognize them when you see them. Um, sometimes it's just your soilless mix does not have phosphorus because it's not a, uh, uh, a mineral soil. And our local minerals in the White Horse area are very rich in phosphorus, but the soilless mix is not. Okay. Got that one too. Uh, so 1247. So I think we're doing fairly good on time for a couple more questions, but I know that Taryn would like to follow up at the end and to, uh, there are some of those um, draw prizes as well, but we probably have time for a couple more questions here. I'm just making sure I'm not missing any. Okay, I think I got, oh, let's see. Yeah, no, got that one, got that one. Yeah, when I first gardened, I used to uh, have my garden laid out into four rows and I would sequentially move through from soil builders to nitrogen feeders to main heavy feeder crops. And the only problem with that is that suddenly your garden is dictating what crops you're growing versus um, you always want to focus on what, what do you want to grow and add on some extra things and uh, certainly doing a soil building. Um, one thing I like to share with uh, growers is that don't forget about growing grains. Uh, barley is a really easy crop to grow and there's more to barley than making beer. 
Um, barley is a forgotten grain. You can access it. Uh, sometimes it's in the seed library. You can get it from salt spring seeds and other sources. Uh, if you're going to eat, use it as a whole grain, it makes a wonderful risotto instead of rice. Uh, you can cook the whole grains and make your own poke bowls with them, add them to salads. Uh, it has a very nice firm texture with a nutty flavor. It's sort of a forgotten grain that those of us in North America, our grandparents would have eaten barley. Uh, historically, porridge was always made out of barley. And we do have a local grain farm out here um, that uh, they have expanded into uh, obtaining a flour mill and they make locally grown and flowered barley and wheat flour and a number of other products. Um, they're out by the Yukon Grain Farm, but they're called the Hinterland Flour Mill. You could even get uh, pancake mixes made with barley flour, brownie mixes, um, barley porridge. Yep, and I got a few of their product labels around my office here stuck on the walls just to remind me. But uh, it's a great grain and you can actually grow quite a bit. Uh, I grew two beds at the community garden a few years ago as a demonstration crop. Those beds were four by 20 feet. And I think we got uh, three kilos of barley, which goes a long way. A cup of barley will give you three crops as a side dish and dinner. And if you do it with beef broth and uh, mushrooms, you make an amazing risotto, which people are just blown away by. And uh, uh, to give you an idea of the caliber of their recipes, um, Martha Stewart has a lot of barley risotto recipes. So that's fancy if Martha's doing it. Okay, oh, here we go. Okay, more questions. And I better watch the time at this point. Um, what is the easiest way to lower pH in an overly alkaline soil? Yes, soils in Whitehorse because of our limestone mountains like Gray Mountain. Uh, are high in uh, calcium, magnesium. So um, the, the preferable way to lower the pH in your garden would be use peat moss or compost. Both of them will moderate it. Compost will bring it just to pH seven eventually, it's slowly. Um, peat moss could bring it a little below seven. It might take reduce a bit faster than uh, um, compost, but the third way, which is you have to follow the instructions, is to use a product, uh, organic based product called garden sulfur. And you have to measure your area and measure the sulfur, work it in, and that does it uh, much quicker. But you have to make sure you don't over treat your soil because the pendulum will swing to the acidic side and create new problems. But yes, definitely alkaline soils. Uh, do not readily absorb all of the nutrients at the same rate. Ideally, if your soil is pH 7 or even 6.8, you're going to maximize the available nutrients in your soil. So if, you're, if your soil happens to be 7.9, 8.0, try and bring it down. Get it down to, like to at least a 7.4 and do it slowly, a little bit every year, peat moss, compost. Uh, question, are you having on-site visits to the farm this year? We are expecting to do that. Uh, usually, traditionally, our egg uh, research farm demonstration days have been the first week of August, so stay tuned for public notice. Oh, good, and I got a five-minute warning from two minutes ago, so three minutes left. So, yes, uh, we hope to be having a public... Um, tour of the research farm this year. You can come out and see the, uh, the green bush beans in our marginal crop trial out in the back corner. We also have potato trials going on this year to help some of the local producers and to help Agriculture Canada evaluate their new potato varieties under northern conditions. Last year, we had 18 varieties of potatoes growing out of the research farm. There are uh, some raspberries uh, growing in the back, or there used to be. They've been phased out, but we also have uh, Haskaps and Saskatoons for demonstration crops, black currants. Uh, it's a good way to see what people are working on and what we're growing. So it looks like we're in the home stretch here. Ah, okay. 
Yes, and we're getting an update on our next seed talk, which is uh, Tuesday, July 19th. That one's on uh, pests. And it looks like the, uh, yeah, on Thursday, August 25th, oh, we're going to have a, uh, a talk on the potatoes out of the research farm. So that's great. I sort of gave you a little advanced information on that. You'll get to see how the other, the newer potato varieties perform under Yukon conditions. That's always good to see. Okay. So Taryn, how are we doing there? It looks like we're 1253. We're in the home stretch. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. It looks like a final question. Uh, raspberries have seemed to have died off. Can they be at the end of their lifespan? They could be. What happens sometimes is that they will uh, exhaust their soil, the nutrients will become root bound and they would need to be rejuvenated. Uh, perhaps um, dig out part of the raspberry bread, try and, bed, try and save some of the canes and replant them, but work in some manure. Uh, and if they are wild raspberries, uh, maybe look at some of the more productive um, commercial cultivars. That might be worth considering as well. I've got a bed like that. They get a little smaller each year. Yet over my compost pile on the edges, they get bigger each year. So yeah, like a lot of plants, they can get root bound and just like your rhubarb patch. So there we go.